But I wanted to talk about this center, and let's just go back to the very beginning. It is called the Howard Science Center for Presidential Studies, and I was looking at this uh, this book put forward by Grand Valley, the Grand Valley Magazine, and it was talking about some of the collections of books you have. How did this begin? Not the books, but the center. How did the idea for this first come about? Well, I'll tell you, Ralph Hallenstein is the man who was the founding benefactor of the Hallenstein Center. He's from Grand Rapids. He's 96 years old. He had a long and distinguished career as a businessman, as a diplomat, as somebody who served President Eisenhower. And before that, he was the chief of intelligence in World War II under General Eisenhower and was the man, really, one of the first Americans to go into liberated Paris in World War II, some of the Nazi concentration camps. First American to see with his own eyes. This is a man who's been around the block, been around the world. He was a, an observer at Vatican II, a tremendously uh, uh, aware person of all of the problems that our leaders face around the world, and also somebody who wants to give. And so uh, he started meeting with Don Lovers, uh, the president, then president of Grand Valley State University. And in 2001, they decided to set up the Hallenstein Center. This was before I came on the scene. So it was a tremendous uh, start because Ralph uh, had great hopes for this. Uh, they uh, they uh, brought me aboard in 2003, July 2003. We got a fast start. We started having conferences right away, and we try to have about 30 programs a year in which we bring in world-class speakers from around the country, indeed from around the world, to address the key issues of our day. I want to kind of put in perspective for people who may not know Mr. Howenstein. One of the most vivid memories that I have of him, we were all sitting in one of the smaller dining rooms over Grand Valley State University before an event, and he was sitting next to Henry Kissinger. And when uh, Dr. Kissinger got up to address us all before a larger meeting, he spent most of his time talking about the war recollections between he and the colonel, as he referred to him, as they talked about their World War II experience, their shared experience. There are not a whole lot of people who can carry on that kind of a conversation with Henry Kissinger. That was pretty impressive. He it was impressive. In fact, Ralph Hallenstein knows so many individuals. Uh, I'm always impressed by the number of people that he stays in contact with, and I think that's been one of the secrets of his longevity. He has remained so involved. Here's something else about Ralph Hallenstein that very few people know. You know, a lot of founding benefactors will write a check and they'll say, good luck to your, your center. Ralph Hallenstein actually comes to all of our programs. He comes to our Leadership Academy programs. He will sit at a round table and discuss with students, and he'll debate them. He will offer observations so that when our students have a speaker, say Richard Norton Smith, Ralph will actually come to the small seminar just for the students and he'll pitch right in as well. It is a wonderful environment. We are really fortunate to have that kind of commitment from Ralph. So that leads us into what do you do? We know how you got started. You have this benefactor. You have this idea with the university. It's a great plan, but now what do you do and how do you implement this and who do you impact and who comes to you for resources besides me? <laughs> well, what we try to do is illuminate leadership by looking at the American presidency as a crucible of leadership, one of the toughest jobs in the world for leaders. We try to throw a light on that to tell us what does that say about American history? What does it say about the challenges of leadership? What does it say about our responsibility as, as citizens, our civic literacy. Do we have enough to get through, for example, the election 2008? And I try to bring in speakers who are provocative and accomplished. Always somebody who has, uh, if, if they have a strong argument and they've made that argument with integrity, they're welcome at my table. We don't have a political litmus test for the speakers who come. I strive for balance in the programs. For example, when you observed just a few minutes ago, we had both Hitchens brothers. It was to debate the Iraq War. So I have these voices come in, and the students are one of our target audiences here in Grand Rapids. But we do more than just try to reach out the stu to students with our Leadership Academy and programs. We also try to reach out to the Midwest and to West Michigan with a, uh, a speaker series that really does attract some of the most interesting, compelling voices right now that are controlling public discourse. If you think of a Richard Norton Smith or an H.W. Brands who's come so close to winning the Pulitzer Prize, he's won scads of other prizes, and we actually have those people come in as scholars and residents, and they stay with us so that audiences that will drive in from Nebraska and from Ontario and from Ohio, they come in, they stay a few days, they actually get to know the scholar. They can meet with him, they'll go out to lunch with him, and they'll have this one-on-one -on -one discourse. 
The things that I hear again and again by offering those programs are really encouraging because people are hungry for the knowledge. They want that deeper understanding of what's going on when you just read the newspaper headlines. Sometimes you really can't divine what's happening. A third way we try to reach out besides the Leadership Academy for the students and our programs for people throughout the Midwest is we have a, a website, www.allpresidents.org. Through that website, we really try to reach a national and indeed an international audience by having essays from some of these world-class people uh, presented for anybody who wants to learn more about the presidency or leadership or American history. And we have, of course, uh, YouTubes of our, our videos of some of our exciting events, and so people worldwide literally can access our programs. Just a little note, I was interested in that Hitchens v. Hitchens debate to see where people were looking at that YouTube video. We had people on every continent but Antarctica accessing it. We were number five, for example, in South Korea. Imagine that last week.